invitation, Muriel. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the power of the wireless network. And um, I promise Andrea and I did not coordinate our talks before. <laughs> um, so some of the things might be very similar, some might be slightly different, and I'll try and put maybe a little bit of a twist on some of the things. Um, so I'll go quickly through this, because we all know what the world in 2020 looks like, if we're thinking of that's the time frame for 5G, where we all want more applications, more services, anything, anywhere, anytime, any device. And there's just a lot more stuff that's happening. We want the high data rate, the, high vi the video on all the devices, wherever we go. We talked a lot about IoT this morning, so everything, maybe the water bottle will have an IP address, and everything, every object around you will be connected. Um, and then there will be screens everywhere. And the bottom line of all of this is the wireless network is really at the heart of this, and we just have a lot more traffic that we're trying to pump through. Whatever the application is, whatever the use case is, we don't quite know what they are. We have a sense, but there will be more than we can imagine, but it will just drive a lot of traffic in the network. Um, so th the wireless network is inherently powerful. So the power of the wireless network is just what does the wireless network allow you to do? And a lot of other industries rely on more communication networks, rely on more wireless networks just to be efficient themselves. So if you think from a carbon emissions perspective, a lot of other industries rely on communication technologies to reduce their own carbon footprint. So wireless networks will be inherently powerful from an environmental perspective as well as simplifying our, um, our lives and sort of getting to the how do we save time in the future? How do we automate our lives? There's going to be a lot more networking and a lot more wireless network um, specifically. So the question then is, and I'll try and be a little bit provocative, can we afford the, this future of communication? Uh, from an economic but also from an environmental perspective, I, I made the point this morning that maybe the metric to, to care about is the cost per bit in general, uh, all the costs in general in the network of building, deploying, managing, rolling out, operating the networks. I'll concentrate specifically on the energy cost um, that comes with leading energy program. I just focus on the energy. But, um, so we have all these applications. We have all this traffic growth. We have the IoT, all, everything that's happening from an application uh, service uh, traffic perspective. And one of the big trends is that you need network densification to handle it, whether it's small cells, whether it's more equipment of the same, whether it's different technologies. But generally, in wireless as well as in the other parts of the network, fixed access, core networks, we go into more distributed data centers, we go into putting equipment closer to the users. Generally, there's a trend towards network densification. And then the question is, what does network densification do to you from an energy perspective? We know that we, from one generation to the other, from every, every rollout of the equipment, it becomes more efficient. But the traffic growth is much more than the, um, the improvements in energy efficiency. So we, we start seeing a gap where Energy efficiency is, is certainly happening, but traffic growth is outpacing the energy efficiency. And then that will have, obviously, impacts that the energy consumption might grow. Um, I'm not talking really about it from an environmental perspective. I mean, let's get that out of the way. And the environmental perspective is important. We want to do the right thing for the environment, the climate, and, and so forth. But let's also remember the ICT industry as a whole is just 2% of global carbon emissions. Data centers is a quarter. TVs, PCs, printers is half of it, and the network is a quarter. So we're talking like 0.5%, 1% that we really affect from a global carbon emissions perspective. So it is important, but that's not how you really change it. I'm talking about environment, uh, economic, uh, operational, and technical challenges that are tied to the energy consumption. How are we going to deploy uh, a lot more equipment? How do we power the equipment? How do we get the power to the equipment? How do we afford the energy bill? Uh, Orange was, um, it, certainly Orange is leading in sort of the drive towards energy efficiency and very prominently a couple of months back made a statement that they expect to spend a billion euros on energy in 2020. The two big operators in the US are already over a billion dollars a couple of years back. So we're talking really significant amount of money being put onto the energy bill and 70 to 80 percent of that energy bill is actually the network. So Verizon and AT&T, they have the stores, they have their fleet. Those are the low-hanging fruits. You can go to the store, change the light bulbs to LED light bulbs, great. Done. That's a one-time shot. You can change to hybrid vehicles. That's great. But after that, you still have 70, 80 percent of your energy bill left that you haven't looked at. Um, and then, of course, we have to keep in mind it's not just the US and Europe. There's a whole part of the population that doesn't have access to the internet. I think we touched a little bit on that this morning. How do you provide um, services when you don't even have a power grid, when you don't have the basic infrastructure? And energy is, you know, energy efficiency is maybe the, the enabler to get, um, to, get to that deployment. Right? 
so that's really the motivation for why at Balabs we're looking at, at, um, at the network energy, um, energy efficiency and low energy consumption. Okay? So um, what's the grand vision? The, the grand vision would really be, can we build a network with zero power? So at this point, some of you should just say he's crazy. We should not listen to him. Um, but that would be the grand vision. Can we actually get all the information, all the communication, all the services we want at zero power? And in my opinion, there are three zeros. The first one is zero grid power. Can we really get this off grid for the environmental reasons, but also so we don't have the operational dependency of bringing power to the equipment or maybe deploying equipment only in those places where we have power? But now, if I free the, the equipment from the power grid, I can really deploy it anywhere I want. And I can deploy it much faster. Right? How do I reduce the wasted power in the network? How do I get to zero wasted power? We spend a lot of, we actually spend a lot of power on cooling, but no offense to people working on thermal management, but cooling doesn't do any useful work for you. It's there because we spend a lot of, en uh, a lot of energy to run the equipment. And we spend more, sometimes the same amount of energy, just to cool the equipment. So that's, that's great. We have to do that. But if we can reduce that, if you get to passive cooling, very efficient liquid cooling, you can get a factor two right there. So how do we reduce the overheads that we have in the, in the networks? And then, so those two zeros, I think, are actually pretty, um, pretty realistic. We can get to zero grid power. Just a question of, is it technic it's technically possible, is it economically viable and practical? Zero wasted power, we can probably get to epsilon. Maybe not quite zero, but we can certainly get to epsilon. So we don't have any overheads. We don't spend energy on non-useful work. The third zero is zero energy per bit. And, and that's there's a little bit of marketing here. Here I really mean, can we get to maximum efficiency where I don't spend any more energy than I absolutely have to? So it's sort of zero energy above the minimum limit, the minimum amount. And maybe we don't know what the limit is. But I want to get maximum efficiency. So the zero energy per bit is really I want maximum efficiency. So when I do spend energy, it comes from a uh, local energy source. I put all that energy to maximum work. So I do maximum work with that jewel that I spend on um, bit processing, storage, transport. Okay. Um, so that's sort of the grand vision. And a lot of what we do within Bell Labs, as well as with a consortium uh, called Green Touch, is really trying to get towards that maximum energy efficiency which is then also an enabler for a lot of the other, um, the other two zeros here. Okay? The joke in Bellabs is that I was desperately trying to find a fundamental limit at 7, because then I could say I work on 007. But there is no 7 that I could find. So that's maybe a research challenge. If somebody knows an, a fundamental limit on energy where the number is 7, we'll, we'll put that in. Okay? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we've done specific on the wireless side. Um, looking at heterogeneous networks and small cell networks. And with energy, in general, you have to look at the entire, uh, the entire network. You can't just focus on the hardware. You can't just focus on architecture. You can't just focus on algorithms, protocols. You have to look at everything together. Ultimately, the energy is consumed in the hardware. An algorithm doesn't consume energy, but still, you need to look at the algorithm. You need to look at the hardware, look at everything. So uh, as Andrea mentioned, uh, small cells are definitely the way to go for capacity increase. But they've also been shown to be very good for energy, uh, energy efficiency, with the provision that you turn them off when you don't need them. So if you just blanket deploy small cells, but you don't have a lot of traffic, and you don't turn them off, then you just be spending energy, but you don't have the, the bits that, that are handled by the network. So if you look at energy per bit, you have the energy because the small cell is deployed and turned on, but you don't have the bits. So your energy efficiency will be really suffering. Um, and from a, from a project that, um, that we've done together with universities in Germany and Intel uh, called IntelliSpectrum, we've sort of shown that if you just take a traditional uh, LTE network and you just drop small cells in there, you didn't do any of the other optimizations, you can get factor 50% 50, 50 improvement in energy efficiency. Just, and this is at the total energy level. It's not just on the RF. It takes into account the actual processing as well as the backhauling out of the small cells. So that's sort of run-of-the-mill, no other optimizations, no other really disruptive technologies, you can get a factor two pretty easily just by, by using small cells. Okay. So then it gets more interesting. Then, then you can ask the question, well, what happens if we actually now try and optimize these networks? And this is some of the work that we've done in Green Touch. Um, and now you say, I don't just drop small cells into the network, but I'm trying to really optimize the entire network. And I want to, uh, but I'm not going to sort of the really disruptive technologies yet, like massive MIMO and so forth. But I'm just saying a HetNet LTE type network. But I'm looking at the future where I also allow myself to, to, um, to envision future hardware. So I'm looking at the 2020 network. I'm looking at the amount of data that the network will have to handle in 2020. 
And um, Green Touch, the reference is, is a 2010 network because that's really when Green Touch was started. So we looked at the most energy efficient technology in 2010, uh, which was LTE because it was already deployed. So we consider LTE an LTE macro network as the reference with a traffic of 2010. And then we try and project what the energy efficiency would be in a future network that handles the traffic growth okay, from sort of a 90-fold increase in traffic between 2010 and 2020. Um, so naturally, you get some energy efficiencies just because of the traffic growth, which was a little bit surprising. But if you think that the, the network initially is deployed for coverage, wireless networks are initially uh, are deployed for coverage, and when you deploy an LTE network at the beginning, there's very little LTE traffic on it. And now you can, act, you can have a traffic increase on the network without deploying more, more equipment. So without increasing your power consumption on the network, you deploy, um, you have the same network, you get energy efficiency gains. And, and that was a little bit surprising that we didn't, uh, didn't quite expect that uh, to be that significant uh, an effect. Then we also look at hardware improvements. What would the power consumption of a macro network, a macro base station or a small cell base station be in the future? And on the, um, sort of this, uh, the top right part here, this chart shows a little bit um, the, the top blue curve is sort of uh, the, the two top blue, uh, blue and grayish curves are macro base stations today. And you see that there's quite a bit of offset power consumption even at zero traffic. Uh, and these curves tend to be somewhat flat. So you spend a lot of power even when there's no traffic going through the network. And that goes towards the wastage of the, of the, of, of the energy. So one of the drivers on hardware is get the offset power low so that you have almost zero power when there's zero traffic. You have full proportionality on the, the power consumption relative to the, to the traffic. So get the offset low, get a 45 degree angle, essentially, and then really also make the peak power consumption go low. And those are all your technology improvements from a hardware perspective. Just a small cell will consume much less than a macro, of course, but also how can we reduce the power consumption of the macros? Right? That's, a key, that's a key part. Um, then we looked at how do we optimize the actual transmit power of the macros. We have 43 dBm transmit power on macros today. Is that really needed? Now, one of the constraints when you work on energy, you can't degrade quality of service. So the amount of traffic you have to support is fixed. The quality of service that you provide is fixed. So you can't, well, you could, but we're not playing trade-offs between energy and quality of service or energy and, and capacity. It's really the amount of traffic is given. How do I get the energy low? And you don't have to have 20 watts, 40 watts RF power on your macro base stations to still support the amount of traffic. You'll still be interference limited, but you don't have to have the maximum power. You can go to a few watts even on your macro base stations and still have the same, uh, same capacity without performance degradation. Um, then you can look at optimizing the inter-site distance. The, the LTE network is basically, basically deployed in those locations where we deployed the 2G base stations. But what if I could really optimize the location of these macro base stations? Or maybe I move them closer, maybe I move them further apart. And especially if I can couple that optimization with the optimization of the RF power. Right? And that's what the bottom right graph is showing where you have different inter-site distances. Get, for each inter-site distance, we also optimize the RF power jointly with the inter-site distance. And you see that there's sort of a sweet spot where if you shrink the inter-site distance too much, you have too many of the base stations. Your overall power consumption will go up. If you separate them too far, then your quality of service will start to degrade. Uh, and you will have to increase your transmit power to make up for the inter-site distance. So there's sort of a sweet spot of the inter-site distance and the, um, and the RF power. Then you can also look at optimizing the number of small cells. The result I previously mentioned is just a couple of small cells per macro sector. But what if you deploy more and you optimize how many you deploy? Um, and then, of course, you need to put the sleep modes in. As I mentioned, if you don't turn things off when you don't need them, even at the macro base station or the small cells, you will really hurt your energy efficiency. And then finally, from an energy efficiency perspective, we assume that it's all um, fiber backhauling because that's the most efficient technology. But you can also follow some of the, the advances that happen in fixed access networks for residential and enterprise networks and see if you uh, apply those advances to small cell or macro backhaul technologies. And especially as you go to small cells where the power of the small cells becomes much smaller, all of a sudden the backhaul power consumption becomes a dominant component. So any advances there will really also help your overall energy efficiency. Okay? And so um, we, uh, we have a paper that will come out in, um, in ICC in a couple of weeks where we say when we compare in this green touch framework of a 2010 network with this 2020 network, where you take all of those things into account and you've optimized along all of those dimensions, um, you get sort of a 4,000-fold improvement in energy efficiency. Now, you have to take the 4,000 a little bit with a grain of salt because it's really 
what are your actual assumptions, what is your reference scenario, and so forth. But the key result is um, the energy consumption is actually going down, the net energy consumption is going down. So we believe that if we optimize these networks, we can support traffic growth and still have a net energy consumption. Now, what the num uh, reduction? So, what are the, what the numbers are depends a little bit on what your assumptions are and and so forth. Um, so, we think that the starting point for Green Touch was the concern that traffic is growing, we can't keep pace with it, and therefore energy has to grow. And we believe now that that's not necessarily true. We can support all the applications, which would be good for all of us as industry professionals and consumers. But we can also have the net energy reduction. Okay, so that's. Um, that's what we have with um, <clears throat> with just plain uh, optimized headnets. So then you can say, well, what happens if you get into some of these other uh, more disruptive technologies? Can you do even better? Um, and there we include uh, Massive MIMO. Um, and I'm not going to explain Massive MIMO. I think a lot of you are familiar with it. And Andrea did, did also a great job of, of already explaining the basics of Massive MIMO. The wrinkle we need to put in is not just look at the the energy per bit from an RF perspective, but really take into account the energy in all the RF chains. Because if you have 100 antenna elements, you will have, for maximum performance, you'll have 100 RF chains. So you have 100 radios, 100 filters, A to D converters, and so forth. And you have a lot of uh, processing, sort of the massive MIMO processing, the channel estimation, and then the processing of the weights that you're going to put on each one of the 100 antennas. So you really have to look at total energy efficiency. And of course, um, the basic massive MIMO result says if you double the antenna, you have the energy, but that's from an RF perspective. So there's a benefit from increasing the number of antennas in terms of energy reduction, but if you have more antennas, the other two will start to increase with the number of antenna in terms of processing complexity and um, the RF hardware. Um, but fortunately, when you do this overall optimization, you still have energy efficiency gains. So one of the key results I think that will come out of Green Touch is that when you actually look at massive MIMO from a total energy efficiency perspective, it's still beneficial. But there is a sweet spot. You don't want to go to an infinite number of antenna. There's sort of a sweet spot where at some point the complexity will catch up with you, the RF uh, energy will catch up with you. So there's sort of a sweet spot. Um, but it's not the sweet spot, fortunately, is not one or two. And the sweet spot is still sort of in the 100, 200 antenna range. Um, then we also look at ultra-dense small cell networks. What happens if we don't just deploy two, three, four small cells, but now we go to really, really massive deployment of small cell, maybe every 50 meters or so, when you have maybe a factor 10, factor 20 um, scale on how many, how many small cells you deploy? Um, what are the benefits of that? We also look at separation of control and data plane, where right now, your lifeline to the network is also that base station that, uh, that provides your service. But if you, uh, especially if you go to small cells and you want to turn small cells on and off, you're still moving around the network. You still want the coverage, and you still want to be able to get service when you need it. And that usually prevents you from really turning stuff off. Um, but if you have a macro uh, signaling base station that maintains your lifeline to the network, but your actual data connection will be to a small cell. You can really put that down to, uh, you know, in deep sleep. So it's it's a key enabling to really make sure you can deploy small cells and put them really to deep sleep when you don't need them. We also look at interference alignment. Um, we also look uh, a little bit at bandwidth expansion and what happens if you go into low SNR regimes. Um, and ultimately, a lot of the work that Green Touch has done is really a big modeling exercise to understand the traffic profiles, the, the user distributions, and really model the, all these technologies in different environments, whether it's dense urban in Manhattan, or it's a suburban, or it's a rural environment, and looking at all these technologies and seeing which one is the best one. And the, the nice outcome uh, will be, I can't, I don't want to, I can, but I don't want to pre-announce the result because we have the Green Touch meeting in um, just a few weeks in New York. Um, where we'll really announce publicly all the results and we'll make everything uh, available, is that there's not one technology that's universally optimal. You'll find that in some parts of the network, it's better to have small cells. In some parts of the network, it's better to have LSAS. So you really have to look at what is your environment, what is your best technology, again, from a total energy efficiency perspective, not looking specifically at cost, but just from a total energy efficiency perspective, there's not a single technology. And I think that dovetails nicely with what Andrea was saying, that if you build a single network, ultimately you have to build one network, how do you optimize these different technologies? And maybe there's no real difference between dense urban and urban. I don't know where the, where the boundary is between that. So that just means you need to continuously optimize and have sort of a software-defined 
layer that says at some point this is a small cell, but maybe now traffic changes and now all of a sudden this looks like a dense urban environment and I have to reconfigure, re-optimize my network. But I think the key contribution from, from GreenTouch will be sort of a characterization of the performance of different technologies as well as um, sort of the regions when, where each technology is, is optimal. Uh, again, I don't want to pre-announce the results, but I'm just going to say this slide comes after the slide where I said 4,000. So you can draw your conclusion that hopefully these technologies will be a little bit better than the 4,000 I had before. Um, okay, so so far I, uh, I talked purely about uh, energy efficiency, and one of the key, uh, key trends is really to go to massive uh, number of small cells. But let's look a little bit at the cost of deploying massive small cells. Um, if um, the U.S. operators have talked about 40,000 small cells in the, in the nationwide network, but let's imagine you deploy 400,000 of these. Well, one problem with small cells is they're not really wireless. Okay? They're wireless to your phone, but they're not really wireless. They have two wires attached to them. One is a backhaul wire, you know, connect back to the network and the rest of the internet, and the other is the power wire. Right? So now imagine you're an operations guy at Verizon or AT&T, and somebody says, we're going to, we're going to deploy 400,000, 500,000 of these really tiny small cells. You have a huge problem because now you have to run 400,000 wires to each of these small cells. You can either choose to deploy them in those locations where you have power or backhaul, but that may not be optimal. So maybe now you need to deploy even more to make up for it, or you somehow find another way to, to remove these wires. So we have a, uh, a project. This is not Green Touch, but this is a Bell Labs project that we're pretty excited about. Uh, where we really want to go after wireless, wireless small cells. Okay? Really ultimately cut all the wires that go into the small cell. And, um, and we think by that you can really simplify the deployment of wireless networks. Now, how do you do that? The first wire on the backhaul is pretty easy. You just use a wireless backhaul technology. Okay, that's great. Um, the second one, you can say, I just cut the power wire, no big deal. I just use a solar panel, just put it on the small cell and I'm done. I just power it by my solar panel. The problem is, if you look at small cells today, um, and you look at the size of the solar panel that you would need, it would be something like the table here. Okay? So imagine a small cell is a little shoebox, and you're going to deploy a huge number of these everywhere. In Manhattan, Times Square, you deploy a lot of these little shoeboxes on lampposts, bus stops, sides of buildings, and each one of these needs like a, shoe uh, like a table as a solar panel. Okay? That's technically possible, but not practical, not economically viable. Right? And that's just a small cell, so now I'm going to couple a wireless backhaul module to it will, will just make it even harder because the energy consumption will just, the power will just go up. So what we believe is really going after the power of the small cells with a wireless backhaul so that you can make these solar panels invisible. And invisible in the sense that the solar panel should not be bigger than the shoebox itself. So the, I'm looking for the small cell footprint and I want to put a small solar panel on top of it so I can really deploy these and the solar panel will be roughly invisible and will not add to the footprint of the small cell. Okay? And so this is, I'm going after this problem from an energy perspective, but it's really I'm going after an operational problem because we believe that you need a lot of small cells and I'm going after it, after the operational challenge from it. So it has nothing to do with the energy bill in some sense, because if you look at the energy bill of a small cell, it would be like 20 euros a, month, a, a year. So we're not talking a lot of operational cost from the energy bill, but it's really the operational cost of deploying these. And half of the cost of deploying a small cell is just providing these connections. Right? Um, so that's, that's the challenge. Uh, and we believe that if uh, this requires roughly a tenfold reduction of the power consumption of small cells so that these solar panels will, be, will, will fit on the, on the small cell. Okay? Um, so we've already done a few things. Um, we've sort of broken this into two pieces. Um, the first piece is, is really just looking at new architectures for small cells. And the way we go after it is, again, you can't look at every single, uh, any single piece. You have to look at the totality. So you look at network architecture. You obviously look at hardware. You also look at what are the energy consuming pieces in a small cell. And you find that a lot of it is on the processing. So can you reduce the amount of energy you spend on processing? Can you maybe move the processing to different parts of the network so that you reduce the energy consumption in the small cell? Um, you also look a little bit at the integration of your backhaul with your access functionality, and do you need IP protocols between your access function and your backhaul function? So you really look at all the aspects, and we've come up with a new concept, which we believe is a sort of a new small cell architecture that integrates uh, LTE access functionality with millimeter wave backhaul functionality, uh, 
Uh, so fully LTE compatible, you can take your LTE terminal and connect to this thing and you wouldn't know the difference. You don't need to know anything about this new small cell. And we get to peak power consumption of less than 10 watts. Um, and uh, then of course you also want to turn these things on and off. Uh, so we also worry about the idle power consumption. And then you have a duty cycle of how often can you turn them on and off. But uh, what we believe is if you get to 10 watts power consumption at the peak, you can power these things by a solar panel that's about the size of a piece of paper. Okay. So now it's not quite the shoebox, still looks a little bit bigger than the shoebox, so there's still more room to be done. Um, but we're thinking that's going in the right direction of just reducing the energy consumption on small cells. Um, one big challenge with that is it's not truly, uh, we're not truly able to deploy this really anywhere I want because I have this millimeter wave backhaul link with line of sight requirements. So I would ideally like to go to a situation where you pick any location and I can quickly put a small cell down. I don't have a lot of time to deploy it. I don't know where, but you tell me five minutes later I can deploy the small cell. But if I have a line of sight requirement that limits my ability of where I deploy the small cell. So now we're looking at a different technology for the backhaul so we don't have line of sight requirements or constraints and we don't have point to point constraints for the backhaul. And the idea there is to also use Massive MIMO as the backhaul technology. So we talked a lot about Massive MIMO as an access technology in 5G, but we also think it's a promising technology for small cell backhaul. Okay. And for two, two main reasons. One is it is energy efficient, um, but also it, um, it's asymmetric in its energy consumption in the sense that it shifts a lot of the, if compared to a millimeter wavelength, it shifts a lot of the energy to the central to the base station as opposed to the terminal, which in our case means it shifts a lot of the heavy duty processing to the network side as opposed to the small cell side, which will help reduce the energy consumption again in the small cell. So we think that's, um, that's a pretty interesting direction to go. Um, we're sort of in the middle of doing that, um, but we think if we can get, uh, we already got off grid, we already got small solar panels, we already got the power consumption pretty low, but we still have this, this really big nasty problem with a point-to-point -point link. But if we can solve that, we think that might be the next really wireless wireless network. The energy efficiency from the small cells and then the energy autonomy. So we get a little bit close to, closer to the three zeros uh, at least. And, and that might be pretty interesting um, for future networks, not just from the performance, but also from the operational scenario and how you use and how you deploy small cells or networks in general. Okay. Um, I have no idea how I'm doing on time, but uh, this is my last slide, fortunately, unfortunately. Um, as I said this morning, I think the overarching goal for 5G is really the cost per bit. I have to really look at that. We should all look at increasing the number of bits that we can send in the network, but we should also be very conscious of the cost it takes to send those bits, because none of us want to pay more. We want 10 times more bits on our phone, but we don't want to pay 10 times as much. So we really have to think about the cost per bit, and not just the CapEx cost, but really also the operational cost and the energy cost. And um, I do think that energy is the next big challenge. It's, it's sort of, it feels a little bit like the frog being boiled one degree at a time. We have our network today, we can afford the energy bill, and it's gonna be a little bit worse next year, but we can still sort of afford it. But when you take the 10 year window, then you go like, oh my God, this is gonna be pretty bad. So we need to do something. But short term, it always feels a little bit like you're being boiled one degree at a time. But I think it's the next great challenge and, and maybe the next opportunity for, for people who can really solve this. Um, but beyond, the pure wireless network, the, the big challenge I think is, uh, we can call it IoT, but I call it the virtualized connected world. Because to me it's a little bit more than just IoT, and it's a little bit more than content distribution. It's really just how we handle all the stuff around us, whether it's content, whether it's objects, I want to learn something about things that are around me, but also I want to do certain functions in the network. I want to process certain content. So ultimately, the network is just a collection of, of Lego blocks the red blocks do processing, the blue bo blocks do transport, and the green blocks do storage. And I have this virtualized cloud with these blocks being deployed everywhere. And based on what I'm trying to do, whether it's more processing, whether it's more transport or storage of content or functions, I'm turning these blocks on and off. Right? And there's really no difference whether the block is really, it could be a RAND function, it could be a, a content distribution function. So how do we ultimately do this when we have a massive scale of information coming from 100 billion devices where maybe I'm just, I just care about this one bit that's contained uh, in, in the information. And um, uh, so it's, it's a little bit going from the, the bits to the knowledge and how do we optimize the network um, as these generalized cloud platforms. So that's, that's maybe a little bit the next frontier, especially from an energy perspective. Thank you. <laughs>
know, protocols. So a lot of signaling, signaling means, you know, like pick triple A. Like you need to every second, you know, tell your server where the user is, even if the rate is flat. So how does that actually impact your energy equation with small cells? Like you're gonna, you know, you have, you're gonna have to run these server farms to manage whatever you want to do with small cells. Yeah, I, w I would put I would put that in the central central location so that you don't authenticate with every small cell if you especially if it's every 50 meters but probably when you're on that small cell network with the 50 meter uh, coverage you're not in a in a car or on a high-speed train so that might be more your macro network but but, but I'll defer that question, question to people who actually go to the standards I'm uh, <laughs> To that new I, I didn't say that. I, I just don't know enough about what the standards are, are saying. I would just say, if you ask me how to, how I would do it, I would yeah. I would say if you're fast moving, you shouldn't be on the the 50 meter small cell where you're constantly handing off, and those functions, I, the network should know me. Why does it have to ask me? Are you still Thierry like two minutes later? Right? Just like Muriel said, I'm still Thierry after the panel. Uh, you know, so can you do the, can you do it once? And when you do it once, I think you do it in a central location. Um, so, uh, I think for all of the results, we've assumed they operate in the same um, same band. Yeah. I mean, you, I didn't talk about SON, but obviously you have a heavy dose of SON to just manage everything at the at the resource level. Right? We're thinking a lot more at the network architecture level, but then you need the optimization at the lower levels. Sure. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.